It's really my great pleasure tonight to have as our guest speaker President Paul Kagame from Rwanda. I would like to thank him for two uh, reasons. The first one is practical. I think it was not easy for him to be here tonight. He had to reschedule uh, some of his activities and I am very grateful to him for that. But the fundamental reason why I feel honored to have President Kagame tonight is that I think, I'm sure I'm convinced that he is one of the greatest leaders today in Africa. He, after a very bloody war, he was able not only to reconcile the population of the country, but as I understand it, to help creating a real nation, which is not obvious, you know, as in many other states in uh, Africa, uh, the uh, concept of nation is not uh, easy uh, to, uh, to be, to exist because, uh, because of just the division of Africa into borders inherited from the colonial times. So uh, after the bloody war of the 90s, President Kagame was able to build a nation, not only to reconcile people, but to build a nation. And since then, he has uh, transformed the state into a model state and which is very often compared to the Singapore of uh, Africa. Of course, uh, I would say Singapore with better climate as, as I understand it. So, Mr. President, I thank you very much again. I'm going to invite you to come uh, here. You are going to make a short presentation uh, and after that, we will have a short also discussion, the two of us, and I will open the floor to a general discussion. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Dr. Thierry de Montbriar, founder and chairman of the World Policy Conference. Excellencies uh, here present, ministers, senior officials, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I thank Thierry for the kind introduction and for the invitation. I also congratulate you and your team for the distinctive quality of the World Policy Conference. This is a forum focused on anticipating and shaping the future, rather than trying to hold back change. That perspective is refreshing for those of us who experience the world from somewhere in the middle, not one of the poles. So I'm very happy to be back to continue the productive conversation started eight years ago when Thierry was kind enough also like today to host me in Paris. 
tonight, I would much rather talk with you than at you. And uh, we all know dinner is also waiting. So let me make two simple but topical points. The first is that Africa is nobody's prize to win or lose, not at all. It is our responsibility as Africans to take charge of our own interests and to develop our continent to its full potential. In fact, this has always been the main issue. We have been waiting far too long, actually for centuries. Trade shapes a nation's economy in powerful ways. The search for comparative advantage generally leads to gains in competitiveness and wealth. That's why at a certain point, the concept of aid for trade gained the currency. The issue was to build a country's trade capacity so that it could transition from dependency to self-reliance and eventually to prosperity. This should have been the approach all along. Today, Africa enjoys strong trade relations around the globe, whether with Europe, India, North America, or China. Indeed, we want more investment and trade with everybody because it leaves us all better off. That's why coming together as a region has been so important for Africa. Internal barriers to travel and commerce in Africa continue to fall, though more still needs to be done. For example, Sierra Leone is the most recent country to announce visa on arrival for fellow Africans, joining around 15 others. However, that is still less than one third of Africa. The African Continental Free Trade Area is now in force and trading will commence in July 2020. This agreement will radically shape, reshape how Africa does business with itself and with the rest of the world. The revitalization of the African Union Peace Fund, which now stands at more than $125 million, has enhanced the credibility of Africa's security partnerships, and it should continue to grow. The second point concerns the tone of anxiety and the defeatism that dominates current policy debates. Above all, it's about the fear of losing something rather than the ambition to do more and better. Even science and technology, the very engines of human progress, 
are increasingly seen as problematic. For example, with artificial intelligence or genetically modifi modified crop. From there, it's a short step to the false belief that preserving a high standard of living in one place depends on preventing others from getting to the same level. Barriers, barriers go up, trust vanishes. If I may take the liberty of generalizing, this pessimism does not resonate in Africa. There is a determination to live better lives for ourselves. We have already seen evidence of tremendous advances, particularly in health, connectivity, governance, and incomes. Recovering that sense of hope and optimism wherever it has been lost is very critical. We can be better partners, meaning all of us here and beyond working together. That's what will get us back on track toward a better world where everyone benefits. Once again, I thank the World Policy Conference for this wonderful evening and thank you all for your kind attention and interest. I look forward to our continued discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So we're going to start the discussion and then we'll ask you two questions. And after those two questions, we will take uh, interventions uh, from the participants and members. Uh, my first question will be about uh, Rwanda itself. Uh, it is uh, very simple, just the, very simple to ask, probably not <laughs> to answer. To what extent is the Rwandan model exportable to other uh, African countries? One, Rwanda is uh, almost on everything work in progress. They are still uh, doing a number of things, still experimenting, still but some progress has been made. Now, in terms of uh, that being a model, I suppose relates to what has worked, even in the worst of circumstances, or the adversity we have faced has been so challenging. Therefore, the model we have applied can apply in other places depending on demonstration of what, where we have come from, what challenge you have addressed, and the outcomes. Now, therefore it's not the overall model that is going, but except if you pick a few pieces, One piece I have in mind is the model is going to work because it builds on putting people at the center of addressing the problems and involving them. And from there, you move forward. The second piece is if you can change people's mindset 
For example, in our case, what we tried to do was, and this is practically a discussion with everybody or people in our society. We would go to every part of our country. We have a conversation with our people and tell them that much as we have a lot of problems, there is a lot in them that they can bring out to meet these challenges and address them. So we are telling people that, we had been telling people along that you can't sit back and wait that people will come and help. Yes, many times people have come and helped, absolutely. But why wait for people to come and help even on the things you can do yourself. This is what we have been trying to plant in the minds of our people. This is what I'm talking about in terms of mindset, because apart from other problems we found, there was also this mentality that you know, people are poor, they, are, you know, they have no this, they have no that, so some people who have more will bring what they need, they will bring medicines, they will bring food. They will... We found actually the country about 45% uh, of our food needs were coming from outside as a donations. And we said, no, but uh, we can grow food to feed ourselves. Uh, and let's do it. Then we started moving forward. So the model can work anywhere. Not everything is going to work for everybody or everywhere. But overall, the conceptual aspect, the philosophy behind it, can apply in any situation in Africa or beyond. It's about saying, we can do it. What we can't do, then we can uh, rely on friends or partners and we still can move forward until over time we are able to actually do what we were not able to do before. So I think it can, it can work. And for us, we, 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 we don't have in mind anything else that could have changed our situation unless we involved ourselves, uh, sought partnerships, sought assistance, but always knowing that this is our responsibility. Uh, a, a footnote to the same question. Have you yourself been uh, inspired by uh, the experience of Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore? When uh, we started off with our liberation struggle and the challenges we faced even during and after, we did not uh, even think about that. But as we started rebuilding, we started looking all around us, whether in Africa or beyond. And in particularly, we did look at the case of Singapore. Because some of the things we have done have come from us. Many other things have been lessons learned from others. How they address their problems at one time or another, with the kinds of problems and the approaches they made and so that we can also find something in our own. So it was at a later stage, let's say 95, 96. On the margins, when that was ending, that is when we started there looking around to say, what is it that is going to help us overcome these uh, insurmountable, at that time they looked so, challenges. So the Singapore case was very appealing it was the case of Singapore mainly, it was the case of uh, South Korea, and we looked around. In fact, we looked around for not only development models, but also governance models. 
Uh, in fact, uh, our constitution is built on patching up ideas from one place, we looked at uh, South Africa, which uh, you know was also being born at the time, uh, and things they were doing to reconcile the society and approach different things uh, for, for their development. We looked at uh, some European uh, constitutions, the origins, the why things are the way they are. We looked at the US, we looked at, uh, we went to other places. So we kept pieces of uh, what we thought was appealing and particularly to address, our, uh, uh, to, to deal with our situation. And uh, so Singapore was very appealing in many ways. We looked at uh, how they have approached uh, investments in technology, in application of different technologies for efficiency, effectiveness in things they were doing. We looked at how they invested in their people, uh, in uh, sciences, mathematics, uh, different things, and, and then uh, how doing business, when people want to do business, companies, whether small or medium or big ones, what is it, or making investments, what is it that would be appealing for people to come to Rwanda, especially with that background we had that was not appealing at all. So we had so many things to change uh, so that we can uh, stop being seen as uh, some place where people can't do anything and, and created that appeal but learning from and, and definitely the case of Singapore as one of them. Thank you very much. So all that was my first question. The second question is uh, larger. You served as a president of the uh, African Union. So uh, first, uh, what uh, have you learned from that uh, experience? Uh, what have you achieved? Uh, what are you proud, I would say, uh, to have achieved during your terms? And uh, do you, would you say also that the African Union is, to use your own expression, a work in progress? And if, if it is so, progress towards what? Well, Africa, on one hand, is um, a place of enormous resources, whether human, or natural resources. There is no question about that. So the challenge, therefore, is if you have that on one hand, how do you fail on the other hand to have the kind of prosperity, the kind of transformation that uh, you should have given these enormous resources, the statement by everybody that you want to do better, want to be better, want to prosper, want to do this. At the same time, decade after decade, we are a place that uh, can easily be dismissed. So there is a, a paradox here that we need to, to, to resolve. So with that in mind, one year is a a very short, very short time to, to do anything significant. So I was chairman for 12 months, but uh, the beauty is of, uh, that you don't do anything alone. That's where you have to start from. So working with other African leaders and uh, having had all these things in mind that we needed to do to get going, uh, start with the example, the institution of the African Union. How can we get it better organized, better 
uh, effectively uh, uh, producing the, the results that uh, the Africans want? How does it become effective? So we, we agreed on that we need to pay attention to that. And that was the birth of the reforms that we had to cut out and uh, the African leaders entrusted me with the responsibility to lead the reform process. But it was really leading the, the reform process with them, also doing different parts of that process. One thing we achieved, at least, there are a number of things which we achieved partially, even if they are not uh, completed, but at least we got started and uh, we, we know where we are standing and uh, work will continue with other leaders who come after and take the leadership of the African Union. For example, we working with the, the president of Niger, President Yusuf, we were able to put together the African uh, continental free trade area that uh, has been created, which is going and we hope by July next year is we are going to be the biggest uh, free trade area in the world. But it, we, we are not just thinking about the area. It's not just the area. It's also what we do and how well we do what we need to do in the free trade area. How do we, as Africans, trade well with each other? How do we allow free movement of people and goods and services? How do we partner with other parts of the world as a, a group of uh, African countries in this uh, free trade area. So we've seen that come up. Uh, I mentioned in my speech the peace fund, uh, peace fund which means from our own resources as Africa we could contribute something. We can contribute in the area of prevention of, of conflict, in the management of the conflict that exists. We can't always just be running to other countries that have the capacity and going to the UN and say, you know, we help with everything. So we, start, we said we can contribute, even if it is 10%, even if it is 15%, we need to contribute. And now the Africans have contributed the fund which is running into 130 million uh, US dollars is a good thing. It never existed before. We have never been to this level. The level was like sometimes 10 million or even less. So, and then there is a new, is in place another chairman of the African um, Union. We always hope every one who becomes the chair uh, helps uh, cover another area that it needs to be covered. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Now we are going to take a few questions. Renaud Girard, will, whom you know, will be the first one. Um, Mr. President, uh, I'm very happy to meet you again. <clears throat> first time I met you in when the, the bush in the north of Rwanda in a place called Mulindi. And after that, uh, you uh, took the power and uh, you are ruling Rwanda for the last 25 years. Uh, you have been able to maintain peace um, and to develop in an extraordinary way your country, in agriculture, tourism, industry, services, and so on. Um, and it's obviously a big success. You have run Rwanda, I would say, with an iron fist, but an uh, iron fist which works. We call that in French, despotisme éclairé. So it's a beautiful success. But what will happen in Rwanda after Kagame. Do we have a guarantee that the civil war will not resume? Yeah, um, there is the part you started with, 
um, which I think is a good thing. You started with all, all the good things you said are happening. Good things don't happen because you are doing a bad thing. They happen because you are doing a good thing. So that, that is one. Second, uh, I also mentioned it earlier, there isn't really going to be a situation where only one person does everything. Even in our situation, even with the so-called iron hand you are talking about, that iron hand has uh, its own limits. This is where it starts from and where it ends. Third, the judgment in most cases by Rwandans of our own situation from given where we started from and where we are and what has happened in between. One is the most important, second, it's a fair judgment. It's a fair judgment, fairer than uh, when somebody uses an outsider's eyes to make a judgment about Rwanda or its leadership. Fourth, if I were to go into statistics of what has happened, of people we have trained, young people, people actually who, by the way, people who were born during and after genocide, that is around 25 years, constitute 42% of our population. Those under 30, now about 32 below, are 71%. These are actually the people who are doing most of these things we are talking about. They have had education, they have trained, we have been sending people outside to go and study with Europe. Or there was a program to send massively young people to go and... And what is interesting is that over 90% of those we send outside come back on their own. There is no enforcement about bringing people back home. They come back home. And they are the ones running the institutions, most of them. You, those who have been there recently will have met some of these young people running these things. So the Kagame you met that time so long ago, and you were able to see the Iron Fist. That Iron Fist has passed on to many other feasts. There, there, there are many young people, men and women, doing their work efficiently. They give results. And uh, that's how I found my time to come here and have a conversation with you. They, they are doing the rest of the work they have to do. So when, but my time will come when I have to leave. And these same young people will we will decide what to do with their country and we will choose from among themselves who uh, carries on the baton. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, answer, which is both precise and unprecise, but that's normal. And uh, I think that generally speaking, uh, after successful stories, succession is always difficult. Uh, that, I think, is a generality we can agree on. So, I let, think... Let, let me yeah, add please, something. Please. Even where succession has come so rapidly, and where success has been, a 
across the world, there is no guarantee that things don't go wrong. Yeah, we can talk about the cases if you want. Yes, we have had uh, rapid uh, succession and we still have not uh, benefited from that, if it has any benefit from, from that. We, we see it, by the way, from across the world, uh, whether it is the developed world or mid or uh, the kind of, uh, not the undeveloping world like ours. But that's another story for, for another conversation. Thank you very much. So I saw several hands. Well, the gentleman to my right, uh, yes, you. I think you is you, good. Okay, th thank you, uh, Your Excellency President Paul Kagame. Uh, well, my question focuses on the model of development, Rwanda's model of development. Well, you tried to, actually you explained it. Uh, basically, it's uh, people-centered, and then it has also governance model as well, which you took uh, from different uh, parts of the globe. Uh, so my question is, uh, what is actually the model? Because there are already known models. Is it the modernization type, which is not, which I understand? Is this a developmental state paradigm or any other paradigm? Because for me, to my readings and my personal observation, uh, Rwanda is becoming a model of development to Africa. I mean, everyone can, can say it. Even some of them have started to say Rwanda is the Switzerland of Africa, not only the beautiful mountains, but the development as well. So that is one, one of my, my question. The second one is the reform, the African Union reform process. You, you led the process at a critical stage. Now, well, someone has taken over. So are you personally following it or, um, well, I know as a member state, yes, but I mean, the future is your legacy. So what is your, uh, your involvement in this particular issue? Thank you. Well, quickly, let me say this. The, the, the model, people call it all kinds of things. I will break it down into some realities. Maybe we see whether that constitutes a model of one kind or another, or a model at all. But I, get there, I guess there are things that have to be put into consideration. One, there is the role of the state. There is the role of the private sector. There is the role of the ordinary citizen. Some of them organize in the civil societies. Now, one has to find the formula that brings these responsibilities together because it's one country that is being served. So ours, what we have tried to do is to strike this balance in a manner that gives results. The state, how far does it go? in delivering the goods it should deliver. The private sector, how does it work together with the state? Or how, what does the state provide as an environment for the private sector to do what it needs to do? And then on the side of the citizens, the governance part, how do they participate? How do they get involved? So that they feel they own what they have. This is, this is the, these are the three legs of the stool, if you will, that we, we have worked on. But centrally, I, 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 let me quickly also give you an example. When we were dealing with the partners during those years, they were 
very active in Rwanda, supporting our, from all the emergency situation to normalization and the development. Every time we used to tell our partners that we appreciate the kind of support they give us. In fact, we need more even of it, not less. But we also want to be the ones in the driver's seat, leading our development process. So we had to form a partnership. We said we will decide for ourselves, or if you will, we will even work together in deciding for ourselves. We will tell you everything we want to do, how we want to do it, and we can make you partners. But you have to be the ones to decide. This was as early as 1996, for example. So that in itself is very important, and the, whatever you call the model, those things have to be there. The understanding of the balance that has to be struck, people at the center, people I mean the citizens, but also their leaders working together, and uh, the rest is, is what you get. On the part of the African Union, I, I still play a role of continuing with the leadership of the reform process, but uh, in support of whoever will be coming or whoever is there as the chair of the African Union after me. And uh, yeah, this is then we, we, we report to the African Union uh, General Assembly and we have the African Union Commission at the center driving uh, the day-to-day -day responsibilities around that. We have the commission, the chair, and the commissioners, and they participate in that. Well, I am told by the protocol that we should wind up now. You know, I think the protocol in this case is probably the kitchen, but uh, I will take nevertheless one question, please. Mr. President, Rwanda has been the country that has the most, uh, the biggest number of female parliamentarians in the world. Um, and I think also that women are positioned strategically very strongly, either in, in, in the economy, in the politics. I like to ask you whether you saw some real value added on promoting and supporting gender equality, and would you see the link with the success that everybody's describing? My assumption is that there is a link, a very strong link in putting women where they need to be in a very strong position, and the result you were able to have both in the economy and in the society as a whole. So we would like you to explain to us how the case went about making sure that women's rights is good for both the economy and development as you did it. All right, I, I definitely, first of all, want to confirm what you just stated and then I back it with uh, uh, these points that uh, will come along. One, women involvement or participation, as you have said, it says that their contribution to the economy, it's also their rights. And then uh, if you look at the numbers, just look in, in our case in Rwanda, 52% of our population are women. So, I mean, it is basic, very basic. If we were to remove 52% of your population and make it redundant, I don't think it's a very clever move and I don't think you get anywhere. But if you can also look at many other aspects. When uh, we tried, for example, when we invested in education, 
for women, because women were lagging behind almost in everything, including uh, education, education, business, and even the area of governance, they were absent. So we first invested in their education, in fact, their health, their education for women. What is going to be the result? I, I, I also tell you that uh, in the management of uh, population growth, the rates we have seen year in, year out. Rwanda was growing, the population growth rate was at 3.2 percent, which was uh, quite high. Rwanda is a very small country geographically. So we have managed to bring down that population growth rate to something like 2.4 from 3.2. What has uh, contributed largely to other elements, including family planning, for example, was education of women. And women being educated, participating in the economy, in doing business, in doing work, public service, or anywhere, you know, started bringing some sense of sanity in the whole economy and society. So there is a direct link and there is a direct benefit, no question. We've seen, uh, so we, 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 in primary and secondary school education, the enrollment rate in Rwanda is one of the highest, if not the highest on our continent. About, uh, 92% of people who need to go to school access school for the first 12 years. And that is how we brought in women who were being left behind because with the poor families, if they have girls and boys in the family because of low incomes, they would leave girls at home and take the boys to school. Uh, and, and so we have now made sure that no girl is left behind. Everybody's getting educated. And they perform as well as the boys, in some cases much better. So all of these things can't add up to nothing. They, they add up to this impressive progress and uh, the results we see in every sector of our society by numbers alone, raising people, women who participate by restoring the rights they should have in, and for their participation in uh, what affects them and what affects everybody else, by improving their health, their productivity in the area of agriculture or in the business or anywhere else. I mean, you can go on and on and on every case speaks for itself that women should not, by the way, if you flipped it the other way around, if it was uh, women living behind the men, you would end up with the same poor results. So it, it has to be the society as a whole being taken care of and particularly making sure that uh, women are restored right at the center where they belong and as part and parcel of our society. Well, Mr. President, I think that a good evening is uh, when you can combine in a harmonious way food for thought and food for eating. Uh, I think we have reached a good equilibrium tonight. I wish to thank you again very, very much for having come uh, here with us. It was a great honor, pleasure. And uh, I think you have indeed given us a lot of food for, for thought. So thank you very much. And I hope that it is not the last time that you will uh, come and, uh, to the World Policy Conference. Thank you. Thank you.